Well, good morning. I'm uh, very pleased to introduce Miriam Hudler uh, from the Massachusetts General Hospital. Miriam did her undergraduate training at uh, Harvard and then went, uh, as it's known, to the other Cambridge in the UK on uh, uh, an exchange uh, fellowship and got her PhD in genetic epidemiology. Came back to Boston area for medical school and then came here as uh, an intern and resident, and then back to Austin, where she did her fellowship and is now a faculty member at uh, Harvard Mass General Hospital, and uh, has done uh, her postdoctoral work uh, with Jose Flores, who gave a nice introduction, a preview of the work that she's going to present to us, but she now has a K award and uh, had a very important publication recently. I think one of the things we're recently realizing that diseases, complex common genetic diseases like type 2 diabetes and PCOS, is that they're really aggregations of disease subtypes. And she's done some of the really kind of innovative work of identifying those subtypes. And she was going to uh, talk to us about that this morning. Thank you, such an honor to be here, and it's uh, really wonderful to be back. It really does feel like coming home. Um, I just had such a wonderful experience here as a resident, and I was hearing, so my year of residency, I think there were eight of us who went into endocrine, and I was just hearing from the first year fellows that there were four from their previous uh, senior resident year, so it just speaks a lot to the um, endocrine exposure and training for the residents here. So I'm going to be speaking about um, genetics and understanding subtyping of uh, diabetes. And um, I think at the heart of this is this question of when we see patients in clinic, how do we know, you know which medication to give to which patient, especially now where we're in some ways very fortunate that in diabetes there's a number of medications to choose from. So I, you know, thinking about this decision of how to treat each patient, the question at the back of our minds is always, you know, what type of diabetes does this patient have? So if you ask someone who's not an endocrinologist, they'll think, oh, well, there's type 1 and type 2 diabetes. If you're an endocrinologist, you know that it's a little bit more complicated than that, that there's, we recognize additional types. There's ketosis-prone, latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, or LADA, type 1 diabetes, monogenic, and other forms. So I'm going to speak about how genetics can be useful in, um, in in clinic to determine type of diabetes, and this is, I'm going to start by just giving a little bit of background in terms of where we are right now, and actually something that I think is really exciting is that already in uh, the space of monogenic diabetes, precision medicine exists, um, and it's really a model for us in thinking about how we can apply that to complex disease uh, type 2 diabetes, and then moving to the future of how we can then incorporate um, more complex uh, disease genetics for subtyping type 2 diabetes. So I'm going to start with the case. Uh, this is a patient that I saw in clinic. This is not the actual patient. Uh, but he was a 22-year-old who was diagnosed with 20, at age 20, when he had a hemoglobin A1C that was checked before he was, went on a study abroad trip. He was a university student. And he was a really lean, you know, healthy young guy. His BMI was 17.7. He had a normal physical exam, and he had a hemoglobin A1C that just reached the, the cutoff for type 2 diabetes, for diabetes at 6.5%, uh, but he was kind of hovering in that pre-diabetes to diabetes range. So you might be thinking, a young, lean guy um, with uh, diagnosed with diabetes, you know, could this be type 1, but he actually had negative IL cell antibodies, and he was not on any medications when I saw him with that hemoglobin A1C of 6.5%. But he was working really hard to adhere to a low-carb diet and was really concerned about, you know, why was this happening to him? He seemed like he was young and healthy. So in speaking to him about his family, it turned out his father was diagnosed with diabetes in his 40s, and he had a maternal uncle who was diagnosed in his 50s. I to think about this patient and what kind of diabetes he might have. Um, you know, it's possible it's type 2, and I think that's sort of our default. Um, it's not likely ketosis prone. He never had diabetic ketoacidosis, and he had negative antibodies, so it's probably not uh, LADA or type one. So 
that leaves also this possibility of monogenic diabetes. So what is monogenic diabetes? Um, it's, as you're probably aware, it's diabetes caused by uh, genetic mutation in one gene. And it actually accounts for about 1% to 4% of all diabetes, so it's not really rare, but about 80% of cases are undiagnosed. So it's often not recognized, and I'll explain a little bit more why that is. So when we think of monogenic diabetes, there are kind of two categories. Uh, there's neonatal diabetes and maturity onset diabetes of the young, or MODI. Um, and adults, we're typically going to be thinking about MODI because the, the, the difference in these two conditions has to do with um, mostly the time that they're of onset of diabetes. So neonatal diabetes is typically diagnosed by the first six to nine months of age, whereas MODI is um, later in life, uh, peak diagnoses are between 10 to 25 years of age, so um, overlapping a lot more with other forms of diabetes like type 1 and type 2 in terms of the age of onset. And then there's a bunch of different uh, genes, I'm not showing all of them here, but that have been identified as um, causing these conditions, and there's actually a lot of overlap as well between the two conditions. And there are other rare monogenic diabetes syndromes, uh, like lipodystrophy, mitochondrial diabetes, uh, but MODI is actually the most common form of monogenic diabetes, and the one that we're most likely to encounter in patients we see. So when should we think about it? Um, the kind of key hallmarks are that it tends to occur, so we see it in patients that are diagnosed at a relatively young age, typically less than 35, have um, diabetes running in their family, so MODI is autosomal dominant inheritance. Uh, typically patients are non-obese and have negative islet cell antibodies. So you can think of this as kind of not quite type 1, not quite type 2, because compared to type 2, they're typically leaner, younger, and compared to type 1, they're typically a little bit older have negative antibodies, have C-peptide that's still present after three years from diagnosis, and typically have no history of DKA. Now, the, ish, the, kind of the hardest part of all this is that nothing's absolute. So in our patient, he had actually all four of those criteria, but um, you know, we often see, and I'll tell you about another patient later, that it's, it's not obvious. Um, and these, even these, you know, these things, not quite type one, not quite type two, it's, it's a little bit wishy-washy. So thankfully, one thing that can be helpful is there's now a calculator tool out there for free. So University of Exeter in England, they've really been leading the way for um, monogenic diabetes and uh, MODI research. And they've developed this MODI probability calculator tool, where if you see a patient, you can just enter in about like 10 different very simple questions. So their age, a diagnosis, their sex, whether they're currently treated with insulin or oral hyperglycemic agent. Um, the time to insulin treatment, body mass index, hemoglobin A1C, current age, and whether a parent's affected. So those are really easy pieces of information to get during your clinic visit. You can just pop in the information, and it gives you a probability. Um, it's also the same calculator is available on your smartphone, so you can go ahead and download it. Um, I think it's really useful. So with this patient, uh, because he had these features that, and his, actually he was seen by an, an outside an, an endocrinologist at a um, affiliate hospital, um, and she actually, you know, Modi came into her mind, so she referred him to the Mass General Diabetes Genetics Clinic, where we see patients that are either suspected to have Modi and we offer genetic testing, or patients with no Modi that we can uh, help guide their management. And in the visit, um, I won't go through all this, but there's, it actually, we'll have like a consult visit for an hour where we see this, the patients go through a detailed family history, um, explain to them about common types of diabetes and explain uh, what MODI is, uh, what it means to get genetic testing, what possible results are, because um, as you probably know, when you get genetic testing in a patient, it's not always a yes and no. Sometimes there's a maybe, you can get a, something called a DUS or a variant of uncertain significance. And so it's, um, it can, you know, patients need to know that that's a possibility that their test won't be absolutely informative. Um, and then the risks and benefits of genetic testing. So I'm just going to briefly tell you about, for this patient, what it meant in, during, as part of his uh, diagnostic workup to uh, estimate his MODI probability and, and describe the different uh, types of MODI and their implications. So when I entered in the information for this patient, his probability on the calculator came up at 75.5%, which is the, actually the highest that you can get on the calculator. Um, so why do we care? Why is it even, why bother? Ordering genetic testing can be sometimes, to, like, you know, it can be a lot of work sometimes to order testing, so why should we do this? Well, there's three main categories of MODI. 
Um, and you can, so there's three genes that account for uh, over 90% of cases that get diagnosed. And you can kind of bin the different types of MODI just to make it really simple into three categories. GCK, glucokinase, uh, HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha, or other. And the reason that it matters is that uh, GCK, if a, you see a patient that has GCK, you can actually tell them they can stop any medications that they're on. Um, I'll explain a little bit more, but it's not in any way, their hyperglycemia is in some ways physiologic, it's actually not dangerous, you don't have to treat it. Um, HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha, um, these patients are often very sensitive to sulfonylureas, and so they can be transitioned if they're already on, if they don't know about their diagnosis and they were presumed to be type 1 or type 2 but put on insulin, they can often come off of insulin and be, and be treated with an oral agent, um, which is wonderful for the patient to stop having to do injections and take a pill. For the other types of OD, there's not um, a particular uh, gene informing a particular treatment uh, at this, yet, um, but the, it's still knowing the gene can be really helpful for uh, understanding the clinical picture for the patient. So for example, HNF1 beta, MOD, typically there's renal cysts and elevated liver function tests that go with the condition. So with GCK, um, so uh, GCK encodes glucokinase, and so it's kind of a glucose sensor, glucostat, for the, uh, for the uh, beta cells of the pancreas and, and for like, the body for regulating where the normal range of glucose is. Uh, I actually saw that it was on the board here, so I guess I thought maybe it was like the last <laughs> talking I had. I didn't put that. Uh, so it was like really cool when I came and I saw that. <laughs> but it's essentially, um, yeah, just be, so when this gene isn't working because there's a mutation in it, the normal range of glucose just gets shifted slightly up. And it's only just a little bit, and the glucose is still regulated. So these patients will have the hemoglobin A1C to be in the 6 to 7% range without needing any medications. Um, and even if you try to treat them, the body will be very resistant and still try to keep the glucose in that range. So what it means is that you can actually stop uh, treatment. Um, there's been studies looking at complication risk, and they're actually not at uh, significant risk for complications. There are some special considerations during pregnancy that, um, where you have to know for, to determine whether to treat the mom. It actually has to do with whether the fetus carries the mutation or not. I'm not going to go into that, but just for you to be aware. And then HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha, as I mentioned, so these are transcription factors that uh, work in the beta cell. There's um, a lot more variability in presentation than GCK. Often patients will be on insulin when they're diagnosed, and it's, it, they are at risk for complications. It's a progressive disease, so they need to be treated, but as I mentioned, you can often treat them with sulfonylureas. Okay, and then uh, we, so when we order genetic testing, there's um, a bunch of companies that now offer it that we, you can actually get a free kit in the mail um, from the companies that, and then when you're ordering the panel, they're doing sequencing and deletion duplication analysis. Um, it just takes a few weeks to return, and it's often covered by U.S. insurances, which has been a, kind of a progress in the last few years. So that's um, really important that we can actually uh, offer this to patients now. And the reason I think that it's offered by insurance companies is that they realize that it's cost effective. So there's, this was a study that was done in 2014. Um, and if anything, costs of genetic testing are continuing to drop, so it's even probably more cost effective now. But in this study, they said that if the prevalence in a population was, pred of, was predicted to be greater than 30% of patients having MODI, that it would be cost effective. So that, the way I kind of translate that is, if I see a patient and I think the probability is more than 30% that patient has MODI, I should order genetic testing. And it's probably even lower now. So going back to this patient, um, you know, a high suspicion for Modi, ordered this 5-gene panel, and he came back with GCK. So what I could tell him was that it was okay to stop his low-carb diet, continue a healthy lifestyle. He didn't have to stress out about having low carbs, um, just be healthy. He doesn't need any treatment, and it's important for him to know going forward that he is unlikely to need treatment unless he, but he is at risk for developing type 2 diabetes still, so as long as he's <coughs> continuing to lead a healthy lifestyle, he shouldn't need to be treated. His father, as you may remember, was also affected with diabetes. His, and it's interesting, his father was diagnosed in his um, 40s, but that was, in a large part, GCK goes undetected because it's asymptomatic, and it's just when someone happens to have a hemoglobin A1C checked or a fasting, people, or provider notices that fasting glucoses are continually elevated. Um, so for the father, he had 
was tested for the same mutation. It came back positive. He had been on treatment, so we could stop it. And he said, I sleep better now, which also speaks to the fact that these are really good diagnoses to get. It's like kind of one of those few times where you have a genetic diagnosis where it's good news. Um, and I want to just tell you uh, one other quick case because it's actually very close to home. Uh, so this was a patient that was 27 um, who had been diagnosed with diabetes in the past year before I saw her. She had, was diagnosed because she had unexplained weight loss, urinary frequency, um, had went to urgent care, had, had um, glucose in her urine, elevated glucose and a global A1C of 10.8, and she was obese. Her BMI was 30. Um, so she was seen by an endocrinologist, started her on metformin, but she had GI side effects. Um, she was also trying on her own to have a very restrictive low-carb diet. And because she had side effects to metformin, her provider put her on uh, citagliptin and also glipizide, but she developed hypoglycemia. So um, she moved, and I first saw her, um, at that point her hemoglobin A1C was 6.7%. Her BMI was 31. Um, she had uh, signs of hirsutism, so she had uh, hair growth under her chin. She actually also had um, abdominal striae um, that were about one centimeter in width that she said had been present since college. So at that point, you know, I was thinking, okay, here's an obese patient. Um, I really want to focus on weight loss. So I stopped glipizide because that can promote weight gain and, and instead encourage her to try extended release metformin, hoping that she would have a better response than she'd had with the metformin previously. We went really slow and she did okay on it. Um, we kept the citagliptin on and referred her to a dietitian and encouraged exercise. Well, this like never happens, but she lost 30 pounds. And um, so I was like, wow, like, can you please talk to my other patients and tell them how you did this? Um, and her hemoglobin A1C went down to 5.7%. I also, in the back of my mind, was a little bit worried about Cushing, so I checked a late night salivary cortisol that came back normal. So I was thinking, okay, this patient has um, type 2 diabetes, she's responded to weight loss, it seems really straightforward. But then her sister, who's 29 years old, was living in New York and was diagnosed with pre-diabetes and had a BMI of 21, so that's kind of unusual. And then in talking more than about the family history, it turned out there was a lot of diabetes in the family. So um, this shows the patient and her sister. Uh, both her parents actually had diabetes. Her father died of cancer um, in his 40s, and then there were multiple other relatives with diabetes. So thinking about the sister, um, I calculated the, the Modi, used the Modi calculator on her sister, her sister came out at 75.5%. She was living in New York, so I recommended she go to Mount Sinai, and she saw Dr. Kadeem Cheeseman and had genetic testing and turned out to have one of these kind of um, more challenging to interpret results of these variants of uncertain significance in HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha. So what do we do with that? Well, um, the patient was really curious then. So you know, when, when this happens in practice, when patients have a variant of uncertain significance, one of the things that can be really, so the reason they have that is we just don't have enough information. So there's a mutation that's detected in the patient, but we just haven't seen it enough to know whether it's actually causing MODI or it's just like normal variation. So it can be really helpful to look at other family members. And this patient is like really motivated and really wanted to get her, want to get MODI testing. And, Actually, at first I was kind of hesitant. So I was like, well, you know, you really seem like you have type 2 diabetes, but, you know, since your sister is diagnosed. But then I actually, you know, calculated for her MODI probability. And at, the, at this point, when she had lost all the weight and still had this um, kind of hemoglobin A1C in the pre diabetes range, she actually had a really high probability of MODI. And if I had actually checked her probability when I first saw her, which I didn't because I was thinking type 2 diabetes, her probability would have been 58%. So you might be able to guess where this is going. <laughs> I ordered tonight testing, and actually she came back positive. So she had the same variant HNF4 alpha. Um, but this, this was a different lab, and maybe there's more information available at that time, but they actually called this likely pathogenic. And it actually and it fits, the, you know, in retrospect, some of the features of her story fit with um, HNF. So HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha patients tend to be very sensitive to sulfonylurea, so the kind of the hypoglycemia that she experienced uh, probably was reflective of that sensitivity. So what does this mean for the patient? Well, she's, actually, she's already really well controlled, um, so it actually didn't mean anything in, at that moment for her diabetes. She had that A1C of 5.7, which you know, like, is a dream. Um, so 
Um, but, but she actually was really happy to get this diagnosis. She said, now I understand better why I got diabetes, and I'm relieved that it's not my fault. And you know, I think that's something we all struggle with with all our, our patients, that of course, you know, diabetes is never really anyone's fault. Um, but understanding for where, why she had it was really empowering for her, and, um, and she was very eager to have other family members get tested. And she's thinking about having, you know, starting a family, so it will be important for her with uh, knowing potential risks for her children. Okay, so that's where the current state of affairs is right now, I think, for using genetics in the clinic uh, for diabetes, for that it can help us, um, you know, we can diagnose monogenic diabetes, um, particularly Modi, which is not rare. And we're talking about here rare genetic variation where there can be gene-specific management. So how do we move forward now to thinking about type 2 diabetes and subtyping diabetes? And in particular, I'm going to switch from this kind of rare genetic variation to think about common genetic variation. Also, feel free, I'm sorry, I just said this, feel free at any point to interrupt with questions. Have a, for an HNF1 alpha, if you have a pathogenic mutation, by age 80, there's something like a 96% chance that you're going to have diabetes, uh, but it's not 100%. So there's definitely also other factors, even with you know, Mendelian disease, that contribute. So understanding also, like, you know, maybe the fact that they had those other variants is also kind of pushing them to have a younger age of diagnosis. Definitely. So, uh, I guess the question relates to the uh, thinking about the smart population basis, which is that uh, I get that from a research perspective, from a data collection perspective, knowing these genes is, is relevant and is, is, is important. But let's say for the GCK diagnosis specifically, um, I'm thinking as a practical matter, much as there might be a little bit of trepidation involved, um, how is the approach really all that different from, um, from what we would do for anybody we saw it, maybe our tightening up our A1C criteria and calling things pre-diabetes, are we pushing people this category we're going to get treated where maybe if we were a little more relaxed at that point and yeah. if we use diet more frequently, we wouldn't have been treated for many people the same price. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, it definitely makes you wonder because this there, that pre-diabetes range, you know, is that I think there's a lot of controversy around that. There was actually just recently a uh, someone writing about that in is it Nature or Science? There was some commentary on the fact that we're overdiagnosing pre-diabetes. Um, I think the 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 arguments would be for why it matters, why why would she still diagnose? Would be one um, for some patients that pre-diabetes will be this window where you can intervene before the diabetes progresses, and then and it, you know it does seem the evidence is showing that earlier treatment is is very important for preventing uh, complications and mortality risk. Um, so if, of course we don't know which patients are going to progress and which ones are going to kind of be, linger. In that range, and the other aspect is, in particular, with GCK, um, the fact that for women it's a big deal knowing for during pregnancy. So I have a patient that uh, was diagnosed with GCK this past year, had already had four children, and all the children for all her children she had intensive insulin treatment during pregnancy. It was awful. She had lots of hypoglycemia, and um, when she got her diagnosis, that was like the major thing on her mind was that she was really angry. She's like, if I had known this, because if she had known that she had GCK, and she had known that that some of, so two of her children probably carried the mutation, she wouldn't have needed any management, any treatment during pregnancy for those patients, for those um, children. So I think that that is a, I mean, it's a window of time, it's nine months, but I think for those patients, that's a big deal. So that's another reason why it can be important to differentiate pre-diabetes from GCK. So, I mean, it just reminds, it makes me think of the gene that's rescuing you from the myth from the body receptor. That is, if we're, if we're overly aggressive in the diagnosis, is that uh, 
I think it just depends on like, yeah, some people, yeah, probably there's a population of people where we are being over aggressive that they would be just fine doing nothing. Yeah, then we save them from the bottom line, right? Oh, we save them from being over treated. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. But if we were just a little bit more intuitive, you know, like I was thinking, yeah. degradation after degradation. Uh -huh. You know, if you're somebody who's over sensitive, you, know, you kind of categorize these people in these, these vague ways. And then that's the benefit, right? Because, because when you have this, you look yeah. at a little bit more objective. Yeah. Um, but, but, but again, I wanted to say that there's a lot of population. Yeah. We can't be there kind of with our gestalt and everything. Yeah. Because people would say it's the HIV and the HIV and the HIV and the sensitivity to social media is the most sensitive. Yeah. It, so over time, um, some people do experience a loss of sensitivity. It has I mean, that's been observed. It hasn't really been like very well said and understood why. Yeah. You, you could comment on Hadley's estimate that one in a thousand people have GCK mutations, and, and the majority are not diagnosed. They might be diagnosed in their 60s and 70s for an insulin and form they don't need any treatment. Yeah. One in a thousand is a huge instance. One in a thousand is a thousand per million. There are 300 million people in this country. There may be 300,000 people with GCK mutations, and, they, and, they, and when they get diagnosed, they get treated uh, inappropriately, unnecessarily, and actually there are more problems. Thanks, and I, Dr. Farley is like an expert in the field, so it's, um, <laughs> thank you for, for saying that, and um, yeah, I'm grateful that you're here, I think. So, uh, for, so thinking now about type 2 diabetes, um, you know, as I mentioned, there is a lot of heterogeneity we see in patients, and the reason why there's this, all this heterogeneity is that our actual way of diagnosing diabetes right now is very nonspecific. So it's really just hyperglycemia, high glucose, which can be caused by many different possible pathways. So in a sense, type 2 diabetes is this waste bucket diagnosis where we basically say someone doesn't have these other things, and so therefore it's type 2. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the work we've been doing using genetics, but I want to step back for a minute and say, you know, why should we use genetics to subtype disease? Uh, what other approaches have been used? So there's um, one of the first studies trying to use clinical characteristics on a broad scale to subtype uh, type 2 diabetes came from Sinai. Um, so there were, it was using Biome, there it was just a few years ago. Um, so just over 2,500 patients with type 2 diabetes looking at 73 clinical features. And there were three subtypes that were identified. So this was really cool. I think it kind of set the stage for um, using big data and thinking about machine learning approaches. This particular analysis, um, I think the, the, what would be really cool as a next step would be being able to replicate this in another population, which hasn't been done yet. So it's kind of taking the same algorithm and applying it. It's just, I think, a lot of it's restraints and being able to access data, but that would be the ideal. Most recently, um, there's a paper that came out from in Lancet Diabetes and Neurochronology that was uh, out of Leaf Group's group in uh, Scandinavia. So there were five large cohorts uh, with a discovery cohort of close to about 9,000 individuals with any form of diabetes. So they, these patients were um, entered into the study right at the time of diagnosis of diabetes and had uh, six traits measured, so they had GAD antibody, age, body mass index, hemoglobin A1c, homeostatic um, assessment for beta cell function and insulin resistance. So for people who aren't familiar with HOMA-B and HOMA-IR, these are just taking um, uh, fasting, glucose fasting insulin and, use, and looking at the relationships of those two uh, measures to estimate beta cell function and insulin resistance. And they used a form of clustering called K-means and identified uh, five clusters that they actually saw were quite reproducible. They were able to then apply this to these other four cohorts for replication. So these clusters, so the first cluster was a severe autoimmune form of diabetes, which um, we can think of as probably representing like type 1. Then there was a severe insulin deficient uh, form of diabetes, a severe insulin resistant form, a mild obesity related, and a mild age related. Um, these, they were able to show that these categorizations were important for um, differences in the groups for time to insulin use, time to chronic kidney disease, both other complications, and uh, coronary artery disease. So I think this is, uh, is really exciting. 
Um, but it does, there's, some, there's definitely some limitations that it's just worth discussing. So one is that all these patients in, in th this particular study were, um, had their variables measured right at the time of diagnosis of diabetes. But in real life, you know, we see patients at various courses along um, their, the disease. And some of these measurements, like body mass index, hemoglobin A1C, are going to change uh, depending on the time that you measure them. Uh, and then the, kind of the case for using genetics is that the, the genetic biomarkers don't change. You can measure them any time and they'll, they'll always be essentially the same and they're so unaffected by treatment or disease course. Uh, when we look at, when we see those kind of groupings that come out, it's, uh, it's unclear what that really means. Um, so what mechanisms underlying why a patient is in the age-related form of diabetes. But um, anytime we can link something to, that, to genetics, we have uh, a, a, a mechanism in mind, so a potential path to, to therapy as well. And then, um, you know, how do we actually take those clusters that were shown there and apply them to patients? So we can, in practice, what you would really need, ideally, would be to take your patient and put them into the, with the large population of people that got clustered and see where that person clusters. But, I mean, that's not... Uh, you know, possible right now. It, it may be that eventually there'll be some tools that can be used, but right now I think that's a, an issue with the, those uh, clustering approaches as to how we can take our, our own patient and understand which group they fall into. Um, and with genetics, I'll tell you about there's some potential route for uh, clinical uh, application. So the idea is that, you know, we have this idea, we understand that hyperglycemia is um, the the endpoint for diagnosing diabetes, and we have like a vague sense that there are all these different pathways. So when we see a patient, sometimes we're thinking, is this patient insulin resistant? Is this patient insulin deficient? But you know, when we actually, but in in actuality, you know, what you'd love to be able to do is understand for that patient you see in clinic what is the major driving pathway for their diabetes, so that you can pick a treatment <clears throat> to effectively manage their diabetes. So we have all this genetic information now from. Uh, many years of large-scale genetic uh, association studies. So these are studies where you have tens of thousands of people with type 2 diabetes and without diabetes where you're comparing genetic variation and looking to see which genetic variants are associated with disease. Um, but it actually turns out it's really difficult to take that genetic information and connect it to a pathway. Um, and the reason is that most of the genetic variants that we're talking about, uh, or the, the, these regions that are associated with disease, uh, we don't know which variant in that region is actually functional, and we often don't even know which gene is relevant. So uh, we were interested in trying to use this, you know, the genetic information and um, a, a apply it uh, to apply clustering algorithm I'll tell you about. So we looked at, we focused on 94 type 2 diabetes genetic loci, and a bunch of different traits that were publicly available from genome-wide association study summary statistics. So these were traits related to glycemia, anthropometrics, and various labs like lipid measures, leptin, adiponectin, uh, fatty acid levels. And then what we could do is we could take those genetic variants and look to see for all these genetic loci, how do they relate to many, all these different traits. So um, all the traits I mentioned to you, body mass index, uh, fasting insulin, and the kind of concept here is that we're trying to uh, uh, bin together variants that are acting along the same pathway that therefore would probably be affecting all these other phenotypes in the same way. So what I mean is that you could have a set of variants that are increasing body mass index, um, increasing weight circumference, increasing triglycerides, that kind of looks like an obesity phenotype. And then by grouping them together and kind of looking at the traits that are salient that are that are causing the variants to be grouped together, you can kind of infer what the mechanistic pathway is. When we we did this, we applied this, um, a Bayesian clustering method called non-negative matrix factorization, and we saw there were five clusters that came out of the analysis. So I'm going to take you through what these five clusters were. Um, they were grouped uh, into two uh, categories, insulin deficiency and, and insulin resistance. So the first two we uh, believe were related to insulin deficiency because the variants that increase diabetes risk decrease fasting insulin levels, so a, a relative insulin deficiency. They differed by their pro-insulin level. So the, uh, the, the first cluster, which we call beta cell cluster, actually was associated with decreased fasting insulin but increased pro-insulin. And there are a bunch of genes that um, have or loci where we actually know some of the biology that uh, therefore we can suspect the mechanism relates to insulin processing and secretion. 
So it was generally included there, HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha. And then with uh, the second cluster, so here we have decreased fast insulin and decreased pro-insulin. So um, as pro-insulin is a, a precursor in insulin production, I think this relates to insulin synthesis. And then the last three clusters are all associated with elevated uh, fasting insulin levels. So um, mechanisms of insulin resistance. The first is um, this increased body mass, percent body fat, well-known obesity genetic loci, FTO, MC4R. Uh, so we think this is an obesity-mediated form of insulin resistance. And then, interestingly, the next one, there's increased fast insulin, but decreased BMI and percent body fat. So there's um, several, several of the genes are, have been um, implicated in adipocyte differentiation. So for example, PPAR gamma causes um, a Mendelian form of lipodystrophy. So we think this is a fat distribution mediated form of insulin resistance, so kind of fat in the wrong places. And then finally, I think actually this cluster is in my mind one of the most interesting, so it kind of points to a mechanism that I don't think I had never known about before, which is um, increasing fasting insulin, but so a form of insulin resistance that's actually liver centric. So uh, several of the loci that had fell into this cluster had been associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the biology for TM6SF2 and PNPLA3 had been worked out that they, these genes are involved in um, secretion of lipid from the liver, triglycerides in the liver. So what happens is when these genes are defective, fat is essentially like stuck in the liver. So there's a fatty, fatty liver. And that, therefore, what we see is in patients that there's a relative decrease in serum <laughs> triglyceride levels. So it's kind of counterintuitive. Kind of it's, it's insulin resistance, but decreased triglyceride levels. So we wanted additional support that these clusters were actually bio, biologically meaningful. So we looked at, we used um, publicly available data from Roadmap Epigenomics Project, and essentially asked for, in, for each of these clusters, are there any, um, do we see active DNA elements that in particular tissues? And we did. We, so we see that there is different um, distribution of which tissues are most relevant, and also there are the tissues that we had suspected biologically. So for example, the liver lipid cluster was most enriched for active um, liver tissue, and lipodystrophy for adipose, uh, the beta cell for pancreatic islet cells. And then finally, how do we bring this back to patients? Can we bring this back to patients? So this is um, where, we, I'm going to tell you where we are. This is kind of an ongoing challenge now to be able to take these different pathways and then bring them back to treating patients. We looked at 17,000 individuals with type 2 diabetes from four different cohorts. Uh, these were uh, both uh, longitudinal cohorts, but also um, biobanks, so the Partners Biobank and UK Biobank. And what we did is, for each per individual with type 2 diabetes, we can calculate a genetic risk score for the five different clusters. And what I mean by that is just essentially ask how many hits does a person have along these different five clusters, or five pathways you can think of. And we wanted to know whether the people that had the most hits in a given pathway, whether their diabetes was kind of different from other people with diabetes. Could we distinguish them clinically? And what we saw was that we actually could. So the people that had the most um, hits in the insulin deficiency pathway, so the beta cell and the pro-insulin, had lower C-peptide levels, so um, indicative of um, insulin deficiency, lower fasting insulin levels. The, those, so those in the obesity cluster tended to be more obese. Those in the lipodystrophy cluster tended to be, have lower BMI, but actually still be, have higher fasting insulin levels. And those in the liver lipid cluster had lower triglyceride levels. And what we saw was that about if we use a cutoff of the top 10th percentile for each cluster, that actually about 30% of all the participants would be classified into just one cluster. So to summarize that, it's essentially we can use common genetic variation to identify five uh, key pathways uh, causing type 2 diabetes and potentially start to potentially start to stratify patients into these subtypes. Where we're going now is to try to expand this work. So there's been, since this work was published, there's now been many more loci identified for type 2 diabetes. Um, we can also add more traits. And then look, in the, I think the most critical piece is to determine whether it matters. So if you can put somebody in a particular cluster, 
does that tell you anything about their disease cores or how they'll respond to treatment? And then the same approach can definitely be applied to other conditions. So as Dr. Knick mentioned, it can be applied to PCOS. It can be applied to coronary artery disease. Like, so we're starting to think about where we can also other, really all complex uh, diseases, we can start to dissect. So with that, um, I just want to acknowledge the contributors, many contributors to this work, both um, at the Flores Lab at Mass General and also the Broad Institute. And we have uh, collaborators um, at uh, Children's Hospital, um, UCSD, and the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. You're a very nice talk. I wish uh, we see a study with that kind of approach uh, uh, in your cancer has been tested to uh, whether it's cost-effective or not. And, and it turns out not to be cost-effective, right? I mean, with uh, at the state of where we are, mm -hmm. what makes you more hopeful for the long term? Yeah, I think cancer is sort of our model for, for when we're thinking about using genetics. I mean, the, 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 it's a little bit of a different scenario with cancer. Is imagine you're talking about sequencing of like somatic cancer tissue, um, as opposed to with diabetes, we're talking about looking at germline genetics that you're born with. But that being said, if anything, I would expect in cancer, you know, when you're actually dealing with the tissue itself of the disease, that genetics would be even more powerful. So yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think in the end we're going to have to combine lots of pieces of information. Um, I think that the genetics can tell us something, but we also need to pull in clinical factors as well and kind of have a more complete picture. Um, it is reassuring that with genetics, that we know that with the Mendelian you know, monogenic diabetes, we, there's definitely a precedent for genetics being um, very critical for determining treatment. So it, it, I, I'm not familiar with that particular study, but it does make me wonder if maybe, you know, there's, with additional uh, features put into the model, would there be better precision? And also maybe uh, if there were the, the treatments, you know, maybe I'm not sure about the treatments that are used. Um, so it's, I don't think that we have an answer. I think there's a lot of work to do, but I'm so hopeful that um, we can under, I think that even if we can't, right away treat patients better, we can understand, understand the disease better, and come up with new uh, treatment options. So for example, this whole liver pathway, which I think is really fascinating, that there's um, the, the liver lipid metabolism pathway that, we, that we're identifying. Um, you know, I don't think we had previously appreciated that there were genes that we could target to prevent fatty liver. So, you know, this is... So I think there's a lot of uh, potential still possibility, even if we can't use the genetics in, in a given person. So the gas way, how common is that? Is that the, the, the liver the the liver. Liver Well, so um, there's so the way we're right now the way we're defining for any clusters, we took the top 10th percentile. So then it would be about um, and. And then about 75% of that, those people are unique to that cluster. So it would be about 7.5% of <coughs> individuals would fall in that extreme. I don't know where the right cutoff is, so it could be smaller than that. Actually, as a follow-up for that, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, why do you think is this uh, represent liver insulin resistance? Because after all, insulin suppresses the only solution you could argue exactly the opposite, that there is some sensitivity and blocks GG mobilization and that's what leads to fatty liver. Um, well I think there's I think there's many different pathways leading to fatty liver. This is just this particular pathway, the genes involved have been well so two of the genes are GC uh, so there's GCKR when we'll study PNPLA3 and TM6 sets of two and the mouse models um, really clearly show a liver phenotype, a liver primary phenotype for those particular genes. I, I agree with you, there's definitely going to be other contributions, but here we have, there's like knockout mice where you can recapitulate the phenotype and um, and the, you know, the expression of these genes is, is primary liver. Um, so it's pre, as the first step before insulin resistance. So there's first the, you have first the, the fat speculation as the initial step. I think you deserve a lot of credit, actually, uh, for advancing the field in this. 
direction. <coughs> cost effectiveness aside, uh, quite a few cost effectiveness. Uh, there's a general paper recently showing the number of cost effectiveness of the diagram in real practices. This is flat iron and uh, foundation medicine cancer. Cancer, as you said, is a lot easier, right? Because it's, it's a single uh, kind of moment in time. And part of the issue of cost effectiveness, you may find the driving mutation, but it's just a drop in it. Back to your talk, uh, you really have advanced it. When I, when I was young, you did the right kind of testify in commerce. Uh, and my categorization of the subtypes of type of diabetes, not you know, being a drug and selling a congressman, I likened it to a pickup truck. And so the defects were twofold. We either loaded too much into the flatbed of the pickup truck, the insulin distance, or there was a problem with the engine tank. So that was my diagnosis. More seriously, uh, I actually, I'm embarrassed to say, was asked to uh, do a thing in health affairs that had a diabetes issue. And it was actually about precision medicine, personalized, and it was you know, very early days. Uh, but at the time, we were doing the vet literature, there was not much from GWAS. There seemed to be metabolomic studies. There's at least one major medicine paper with a particular metabolomic profile involving certain maybe branched chain amino acids. So I'm familiar with um, the, there's, I think metabolomics, it's, it's a, I have some familiarity with the field in my sense is there's a few key metabolites that have been reproducibly associated with diabetes, but it's been very murky because it's, no, and one of the issues with metabolomics is like the cause and effect, it's like, is, are, you, are you, it's, you know, are you touching, like why does a person have a particular metabolite, is it their diet, is it, you know, what, what, so it's not, I think that's... This is, this is a somewhat much to do with the recall. It was a very exciting campus. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. It was your five words and, yeah, and, and right. Jose was on the table. Yeah. And, you know, so, so, the, the last, last good point, and it's a very recent self-paper from the early institution. Oh, yeah. It, 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 it may be even a cold. No, it was a yeah. So, it's so this is study. showing internalization of the insulin receptor uh, into the nucleus and modifying genes. That's astounding. And, and they, you know, they pointed out that there actually had been a history. I think Ira Goldfein yeah. had been publishing this kind of three years, probably was like, yeah, it's interesting. And then this paper looked very different. I'm not familiar with it. So there was internalization. Oh, I mean. And I just thought that that may have all kinds of new information. In fact, the, the, the DNA areas that the receptors associated with were causing genes that are involved in. Uh, it's some regular methods. Oh, me. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Thanks. So, if you went and did hard clustering and just used the traits yeah. and then repeated your GWAS, would you recapitulate this? So, I didn't go into that because of, like, I, th I didn't know if it would be boring for people with the methodology, but that was a huge part of this work was that previously everybody was using hard clustering and the results were really difficult to interpret. And I think, um, so, so hard clustering, the issue is you're making an assumption that what it means to be hard clustering, that term means that any object you're clustering can only be in one group. But when we think of complex disease genetics, the, you know, our understanding is that, it's, that there's pleiotropy, that a given genetic variant can impact one or more genes, potentially one or more pathways. So, um, so using the soft clustering, I, so I initially tried hard clustering, and it, you get this tree, you get it, it's called like a dendrogram, and you have to decide where to cut the tree to make the clusters. How do you decide where to cut it? There's some tools, but it's, it's, it's still kind of subjective. And then when, when you start to look at them, you know, there's some um, overlap with what we get, but our clusters were just so much more biologically interpretable. And that was why, I, so what happened was the hard clustering wasn't working. I actually went to people in cancer genomics to say, you know, you're doing all this cool machine learning clustering work. Do you have other tools? And they recommended this NMS. But if you just took the traits, not the genes, so I oh, okay. understand that the genes are pleiotropic. But if you took the traits, uh, created the clusters, yeah, which you know, did. like took the group yeah. traits, and you know, clusters, and then did so the GWAS, GWAS yeah. you, you should recapitulate yes. what you found. Yeah, so there's, the, um, there's a paper that recently came out in Plus Genetics from Noah Zaitlin um, in California. And that's exactly what they're, it's called a reverse GWAS. Um, we haven't done it yet, but I, I think, in, so in theory, it should work. I think in practice, still our phenotypes, especially when we talk about like body mass index, 
people with A1C. There's so many things that contribute that I think it can be difficult to um, to actually do what you want to do, which is to have this population of people that are more phenotypically similar. But there's, I think it, it actually, I think it can be a little bit messy. But we need to try it. I think that's a, yeah, it's really a great idea. The group of patients in your study that have fatty liver and low triglycerides, do you know if they were on five liters or not? Um, they, so, um, we don't know. We don't know anything about their treatment because um, it's just right now like large scale data. But yeah, exactly. I think that that would be a really <laughs> cool possibility to treat those patients with a more, because um, we know pinoclidazone reduces uh, fatty liver. And the other thing, uh, what's your relationship So I wouldn't have thought so because so with um, you know mo the most common form of monogenic with Modi, it's uh, beta cell. You, I don't think you're as likely to see the kind of metabolic phenotype that we think of with PCOS, um, but there's other forms of monogenic diabetes where you do, that are more insulin resistant, um, where you have the insulin receptor mutated, um, but there's, so in those patients, I think that they, there can be, I'm thinking of whether, yeah, they can, I believe that they can, yeah, because of one of the things with insulin resistance, you can get versatism, so even in those patients, yeah, there are, but that's specific, it's not what I was talking about with Modi. And you guys may also, other people in the room may know more about that in terms of monogenic disease with PCOS. I mean, there are, yeah. as we've sequenced through our thousands of patients, we find a few laminae C um, and occasional insulin receptor, I mean, yeah. which show that they're biologically relevant. But I'm sure within the agglomeration of these, what's interesting is a lot of my patients come up as high probability of Modi, you know, the ones who aren't that obese, because I see young women all the time, you know, in their early 20s, trying to do diabetes, and maybe I should start doing Modi testing and doing puts them at a certain point where they start and then the other factors throughout their life, the environmental factors are going to impact how they move, but um, but there's a certain genetic background that they start from. And that does class, but I guess I, I, I could imagine someone with the, uh, let's say, uh, liver lipid phenotype turning into the beta cell phenotype over time, whether the genetics yeah, create think, a Right, yeah, so maybe, in, I think that's where we need to be able to model better the combination of the genetics with the clinical at particular time points. But yeah, absolutely. I think that the, as you're pulling in these different um, environmental factors, that you could have more of a picture of, of um, obesity you know, with time. But that maybe, maybe, maybe isn't. Maybe the ones that are fitting in, in these are the 30% that are travelers on the spectrum. Yeah, and, and most people. In their yeah, and not to mislead, most people have a combination of everything. Like most people, you know, the majority of patients are going to have many hits along many different pathways. That's the vast majority. And, we're, and we're, all we're really talking about at this point is where we think we can make it, you know, it's kind of like the low-hanging fruit is the people at the extremes. But most people are definitely a, a mishmash. Where would you cluster people who have treatment for their cancer? Do you know that they have developed Yeah. So that, I know, it's so interesting. I, whether those people have any background... Um, so there's really cool work that's been um, progressing with type 1 diabetes genetic risk scores. It's been in that space where there does seem to be a more direct clinical translational route because the genetic risk score for type 1 diabetes is actually quite predictive. It has an area under the curve of like 90% almost. So, um, but I don't, so I don't know whether patients that 
have that respond to immunotherapy, to, whether there's something in their genetics that makes them more likely to become, um, or whether, I, I, the other possibility is that something to do with the, their cancer, that their cancer might um, have more um, antigen, you know, antibody producing uh, response. Some tumors might more so than others. But yeah, I don't know. I think it's really interesting to think about. Thank you, that was great. Okay, thank you so much.